Welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we're, we're so grateful to have uh, almost 400 of you gathering with us for the sixth Vision Zero Cities Conference. Uh, and we're so happy to welcome you from all corners of the world. My name is Danny Harris. I'm honored to be the Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives. And on behalf of me and, and my incredible staff and Families for Safe Streets, I wanna welcome all of you back to this incredibly important conversation not just about our streets, but really thinking about the future of our cities. Uh, if I may just start with an anecdote, I, I'm, uh, I'm a father of a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And last year I spoke a bit about, you know, the vision of vision zero when you're trying to teach a little child to ride a bike, knowing that there are actually limitations of where they can ride or the fact that the city is not fully theirs and really entering into it from that safety perspective. What I'd like to do is also just talk about something a little bit different today, which is um, this morning I was walking my kids to school and I'm so grateful that they live, that we live about a block or two away from our school. And for the first time, my kids are starting to ask a basic set of questions. Why is it dangerous to cross the street? Why are there so many cars that are parking? Why are all the cars sitting with their engines on waiting to park? All these really basic things that from their perspective, they're starting to wake up to about the realities, not just about our goals as Vision Zero practitioners of making cities safer, but about the dignity and equity and sustainability of, of being in a city. And over the course of this week, we're gonna be talking about those elements of what it means to sort of put an individual at the center about making a city. And I think in the past, many of us have talked about the various you know, you know, people that we're trying to build for. We talk about those who are under eight, we may talk about those who are over 80. And now we are also forced to, to step into much deeper what it means to be building this work with, an special with a special focus on the most vulnerable communities, especially communities of color. Since March, all of us have had to be doing our work differently, not just because of COVID and because of George Floyd, but because it forces us to think differently about what our work means as Vision Zero practitioners. What do safe streets mean? What is this moment really? Is this a moment? Is this an opportunity? Is this a time for reflection? Should we be accelerating in our work? Should we be stepping back? Again, over the course of the week, we'll be having deep and interesting and very provocative conversations about everything from enforcement to the role of our highways to what it means to be practitioners on the front lines of this space. So today I'm incredibly grateful to welcome a, a, a group of a fellow EDs uh, many of you, many of whom you may know, many of whom you may be familiar with their work, but really what the goal of the opening of this conversation is, is about what this moment means for Vision Zero across a number of our cities. And again, coming, at, coming from the perspective of New York City, let me just share with you a few of the prompts that we're thinking about. I think like some of you, we sort of view at least three, if not four existential threats as it relates to the future of New York City. One is we're seeing a death spiral among public transit. You know, like many of you were, we're advocating in Washington to get the resources for public transit that we critically need because it's not just about the lifeblood of the city, but this is critical for Vision Zero as well. The second piece is that we're seeing a rise in at least car ownership and registrations. New York City has at least 40,000 new car owners since COVID. And we're starting to see in many communities that the car is the new PPE. Uh, this was, you know, if we are talking about what's sustainable, this certainly is not going to be sustainable for us and our cities moving forward. The third is a rise in, in deaths and serious injuries across our cities. We're seeing uh, speeding is up significantly. And also we're seeing that it's more dangerous in many places just to simply be out walking around. And the fourth is a critical intersection about our work and racial justice. We cannot be talking about Vision Zero without talking about racial justice, without talking about environmental justice, and without talking about the communities that have and continue to be left behind in this work. And that means everything from how we reimagine traffic enforcement, whether it belongs in, in the PD or not, with the role of the police altogether in our work, what it means for communities to continue to be driven through with the type of infrastructure that has left people into generational poverty, created the type of environmental injustice that for decades has kept people not just out of opportunity, but in hospitals, and now especially, and more so now amid COVID. And also, you know, within all those pieces, I would just add, what is the plan to address them? Across your cities, are you seeing the type of leadership from your mayor, from your governor, from your DOT head? 
who is actually stepping up and trying to own these challenges and turning them into a better future for your city. In New York City, we have seen that there has been invitations for advocates like us to step in and share ideas with the mayor about what comes next, and yet we have seen no action. And so I would ask as a prompt for all of you, every single person who's joining here today, you have the agency and the advocacy because you are here to be on the front line of what that change can look like. And so I would ask you over the course of this week to take an idea or more that is bold and aspirational and that thinks about the future of your city specifically by putting the most vulnerable residents first and using that as another prompt to accelerate your path to vision zero. We cannot continue to live in a place where the priority is around 6,000 pound SUVs that are terrorizing our cities. And regardless of whether these vehicles are run by, by gas or by compost or by electric or whatever else these car manufacturers are trying to sell us, we must be prioritizing people. And again, our most vulnerable. So I am again, so grateful to be with all of you today. I look forward to learning together. And again, please take an idea, a big idea, no matter how big your community is, big or small, and use this as a network to help experiment with it, work together. We are all in these trenches together. And now more than ever, we need to fight harder, not just for Vision Zero globally, but especially for what's happening in our neighborhood. And with that as a prompt, I, I'm just so incredibly grateful to welcome Leah Shaum, uh, who many of you know, uh, hopefully all of you know, from the, the Vision Zero Network, which she's the founder and director of. It's a national campaign that supports cities working towards Vision Zero. Um, the network helps communities develop and share best practices for safe mobility for all road users. She's previously a, a member of the German Marshall Fund Fellow, uh, where her work specifically looked at Vision Zero strategies in Sweden, Germany, and the Netherlands. And prior to that, uh, she was in the trenches with us at the local level as executive director uh, at the San Francisco Bike Coalition. So with that, I'm just welcome, Leah. And then from there, we'll go to a conversation with, uh, well, I'll make a separate set, a round of introductions. Thank you, Leah. Thanks so much, Danny. And thanks to the Transalt team. I'm gonna get set up here. Um, I just wanna say thank you for, for continuing to be such a leader across the nation and across the US to the whole transportation alternatives team and, and the world of advocates in New York City. Um, it is such an important time. I know I've been fortunate enough to go to every one of the Vision Zero Cities conferences. Um, and I think this is number six, is that right? And wow, um, that's actually what I'm gonna talk about, kind of where have we come in these years? You could pause and say, wow, that's not very long, six years. That's pretty quick in, in most comparisons. And yet we know we have no time to spare as I think Danny just laid out. So I'm gonna just really briefly share some thoughts, you know, as I've been very fortunate to work with a lot, more than 40 now communities who are working on Vision Zero. Where are we? What does it really mean? What are some of the struggles we're seeing? And what are some ideas to go forward? Um, and I think really, Danny, you hit it off perfectly. It, it really <clears throat> is about thinking bigger and acting bolder. So to share some examples here. I'm just gonna give a couple, just to remind folks, and I, I bet there are people on the call perhaps um, who, again, maybe you've come to a Vision Zero City conference, maybe this is your first one. Maybe your community does not yet commit to Vision Zero and you're just interested in learning more about what it is. So again, whether you're kind of an old timer at six years or brand new to this work, um, again, I think you're gonna find a lot here through the sessions and hopefully in connecting with folks. But I just want to pause and say, you know, if we showed this map, and we did show this map, you know, six years ago, there'd be three or four cities early on, of course, New York, San Francisco, Washington, DC, Seattle, those were some of the early adopters. And look now, I mean, it's so exciting to see places like Laredo, Texas, Orlando, Florida, um, you know, just folks, uh, places that are not always your usual suspects, right, of your New York's and San Francisco. So really thrilled to see, and there's, there's more coming, but so many communities that have made this shift to recognize that we can and we must do better. So there's the positive. Um, we've definitely been growing. We're hearing people really understand these are crashes, not accidents. You know, it really is a matter of what are we putting into the planning and the design of our communities to see what we get out of it. Um, then we say, okay, how are we really doing? I'm always a little hesitant to show this graph because it is very depressing, certainly, um, as are some of the other graphs here, but I think it's important for us to kind of acknowledge, are we, are we trending perfectly or even, let's say, admirably across the nation so far in our Vision Zero efforts? And unfortunately, no, we're not. This is just a snapshot of a couple years. 
um, in a couple cities. Obviously, this is not showing all the cities, but you know, we know, for instance, New York has picked back, ticked back up in the last year or so, as has San Francisco a bit. You can see, obviously, some of the other early adopter vision zero cities certainly trending the wrong way. Um, so I want to do a little kind of disc, uh, maybe a disclaimer or, or such, and then to get into, OK, how do we really make the change? First of all, nobody expected this to happen overnight, right? It's, and I think that's an important thing to really recognize to say, hey, because your community commits to Vision Zero doesn't mean anything changes. It changes when you start doing things differently. And that's what we're going to talk about. So really, I think we've been our, our U.S. cities have been in this maybe early honeymoon phase, so to speak, right? We're talking a lot about the right things. We're bringing folks into the conversation. Um, there's a lot of good progress happening in the thinking stage, but we really need to be getting to the acting stage. And what does that look like? I wanna acknowledge that, you know, we're up against a big national um, push, so to speak, or, or, or it's not necessarily, um, you know, the national tide is not working with us. We know nationally the numbers are off the charts, traffic death wise, pedestrian traffic deaths have been increasing significantly over the last 10 years. We know, as someone mentioned, the SUV, you know, issue, large vehicles, et cetera. Our federal transportation policy is wildly misaligned with the goals of safety generally. So we know we've got some challenges, right? And then when we look quickly, <clears throat> just to remind people, the U.S. is not doing well, but other countries are. And, and this is comparing just industrialized nations, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, but other countries are at two, three, four traffic deaths per 100,000 people of their population. The U.S. is at 12 or 13 traffic deaths per 100,000 population. We are three to four times less safe than, than many, many of these places. So the thinking about, you know, if we know others can do it, what can we do? And it really is about, well, and, and to pause, we also know, and <clears throat> I'm happy to say, you know, we're at least talking about these issues more, the, the inequities in our transportation system, like so many other systems we've created, we really have deep, deep inequities in terms of how our communities have been built, how policies have been leveraged, et cetera. And I'd say in particular, this is really coming from the ground up in terms of communities on the ground being more aware and focusing on this, which I would say is a good thing. It's something we want to be, you know, encouraging. Yet at our federal level, <clears throat> we have very little awareness or attention going to these issues. Again, state and federal level, I, I hear almost almost nil, zero talk about the racial inequities in our transportation system. So we are really bubbling those up. So I think we're at this point, unfortunately, where you know we've got the excitement over Vision Zero in many places. And again, we've got more and more breadth, right? The map showing so many places. But what does it really mean if we're not willing to make the change? And I think in a lot of places there is there is the walk without. I'm um, sorry, there's the talk without the walk right now, and there's the desire, right? And this is not meant to um, diminish anybody's commitment. No one, you know, generally everyone wants safety, right? We want the same things. But what are we actually doing to get there? And jumping to kind of where we are now, this is where I see us, you know, the traditional approach and folks are probably very familiar, right? We've looked at this in a silo, right? Transportation separate from all the other issues. Um, we think, oh, the police do their job. The engineers do their job, but never the twain shall meet, right? When in reality, we know we, we've been living too long in silos, et cetera. But we've really got this traditional approach of, you know, the traditional ease of engineering, education, enforcement, et cetera. And we're trying to move to Vision Zero, which is a very, very different thing. And you can see kind of where I've marked the Vision Zero cities. And I think, you know, we give credit places like New York, San Francisco, Seattle, you know, they're the early adopters. They're probably, they are further along than, than the newer Vision Zero cities, but we're not yet to that transformative change. And I think this is really where I hope we go in this conference is thinking about we can't do what we need to do if we're still enabling as much car traffic, as much car use as we do. That is not what probably most of us came out of the gate saying in our Vision Zero work. And perhaps that was okay. You know, we won't go back and try and rewrite history or question it. But we need to, at this point, really acknowledge that to make transformative change, it's not just about a few projects here and there. It's not just about nibbling around the edges. It's very valuable, we all know, to have a high injury network and to focus your work. But it's got to be much bigger and bolder than that. It's got to be community-wide, city-wide, region-wide, statewide, right? And this is kind of scary to think about. I don't want to say scary, but it's a big, it's a big order. It's a tall order, right? 
So what are some ways we can really get there? And this is just a reminder of some of the, some of the kind of differences um, of how we approach Vision Zero from the traditional approach. But I, I've been thinking a lot about the environmental movement and this has gotten me, um, I'll say feeling a little more positive because you know, at times it can feel maybe overwhelming and, and difficult, right? And it is difficult, but not overwhelming. So looking back a bit, you know, thinking, gosh, you know, the early days of, gosh, when Rachel Carson's book came out, people, you know, kind of doubted, what is this? Or she's way out at this extreme of ideas, right? And then you've got, you know, maybe the hippies out celebrating Earth Day in the early days, right? You've got those crazy bicyclists biking so that they don't pollute the air. And then you, and you kind of mainstream a little bit with Al Gore, but still he was a little bit out there, right? Now to think, uh, certainly climate change is not a completely uh, agreed upon thing here in our country, sadly, but let's just say the most, most folks understand this and they believe it, right? They understand that we must be doing things, we must do things differently to save the planet. We know that you know, even mainstream folks in the US Congress and frankly, mainstream presidential candidates embrace this and understand it. How do we really think about the arc at which the, the environmental movement, and of course, our work is very much part of that in terms of reducing car use, but how do we really hold to uh, the big change that has been critical here, right? We can't, the environmental movement is not nibbling around the edges. That is not how we're going to stop climate change. So how are we really thinking about big, bold change for our work? And you know, I just found this, this study came out about a week ago from the World Economic Forum and a few other international groups. And I won't read all these, um, you can get the slides if you want them, but I, this one, this quote in the middle really struck me because I feel like for a lot of people, they're gonna come back on budgets and money. It's not the main thing, but it is a big thing, or maybe it is the main thing, but a major impediment is often that concern about funding and really appreciate what the World Economic Forum study here showed. And it was really thinking about um, climate change largely, but connecting it to transportation. So recurring and dangerous distraction is that the transport transition is expensive. In absolute terms, it is expensive, but it is vastly cheaper than the prodigious efforts to perpetuate unsustainable mobility. And we can take that to, to the health of our planet. We can take that to the safe and health, safety and health of our people. How are we, how are we changing minds that this is not too expensive? This is not too hard. This is the only thing we can do, right? And I feel like we're, we're starting to see that again with the climate change movement. And we do have bright spots. Um, we know, I know everyone's talking about these, but we've got to have somewhere to look, right? Places like Helsinki and Oslo reaching zero pedestrian deaths. And what did they do? They didn't just approach a few troublesome intersections, right? They didn't do bus, they didn't just do PR campaigns around Vision Zero. Of course not. They instituted um, congestion pricing. They lowered speed limits down to 20 miles per hour, most of the city. They made tremendous space for walking and biking and transit. And they limited car use. You could still drive a car, but it's not fast and easy or as fast and easy as it used to be. So we know how this works. And we know I've been really heartened to see a lot of places respond. You know, I, it's a hard thing to say, take the opportunity, but to say, hey, in these times of change with COVID, we're really gonna need to think differently. And you guys have all seen the articles, I'm sure, but Paris building 650 kilometers of bikeways and aiming to be a 15 minute city. So you could walk, bike, transit anywhere within 15 minutes. And I wanna really highlight the London example, which has been really impressive. They're, again, creating a lot of car-free streets or opening up car-free streets, more biking, more walking. But the mayor of London, Khan, recently said, if we want to make transport in London safe and keep London globally competitive, then we have no choice but to rapidly repurpose London's street for people. So as Danny said, this is, it, it's so basic, right? We're really coming back to what does it mean for people? And I wanna highlight, you know, these are not just the European countries. I know they get a lot of attention and, and we don't want to focus just there. Looking at places like Bogota, Colombia and Mexico City, and we're seeing Mexico City, they lower their speed limits to 20 kilometers per hour. A lot of traffic calming, bus rapid transit, bikeways, happening as well in Bogota, car-free streets. But I really appreciate this quote, that Bogota wants a city with more space for children than for motor vehicles. Sounds so basic, right? It, it's, it's coming back to just kind of basic needs of who doesn't agree with safety? Who doesn't want a healthy planet? Who doesn't want space for kids, right? And kind of coming back home, I, I was really struck by this. I spent some time in St. Petersburg, Florida uh, last year. St. Pete, they're not a vision zero city officially. They, they do a great job with complete streets and 
et cetera. You know, they're a Florida community though. They definitely have some challenges, very sprawled and spread out. But I really appreciated this highlighted part uh, quote from the mayor talking about the epidemic of speed, for instance, which I know we're gonna get into in other parts of the conference, but to really point that this is an upstream systems level problem. This isn't just people are bad and they're speeding. People are driving too fast for safety because that's how we plan the city. We've invited people to drive too fast. Across the country, we've invited people to drive too fast. We've invited people to drive too much. We've not made it as easy, comfortable and safe to walk and bike, but it's changing. So again, back to, back to the country here, looking at places like Portland, Minneapolis, of course, you all in New York, uh, DC and Seattle, both, both recently lowering speed limits. And so we say, this is about science. I think it's a great time to say, you know, if this is our goal, if we're aiming to get to safe travel for all, which again, who wouldn't agree with this? How are we really moving away from those E's, those traditional E's? And, and I wanna just quickly, we don't have time for this, but I know we're gonna get in the panel discussion. You guys will talk a lot about enforcement and equity. We know we can't enforce our way out of this. It's not the right moral thing to do, nor is it effective. We know we can't educate our way out of this and, and trying to you know, point it at distracted pedestrians and victim blame, we can't do it anymore. So in the end, just to get to, we know what works. How do we really look at the science of this? If in our cities, we want people to walk and bike and be able to mix with motor vehicles to some degree, we've gotta be designing our streets, setting our speed limits, and I would suggest automated, not, not, not uh, police enforcement, around 20 miles per hour. That's a level that people can be safe, right? So really coming back to, you know, how are we bringing this to, hey, we're not piddling around the edges. If your community is committing division zero, so if you're new division zero on this call and you're really thinking about it, or your, your community is already in division zero, like many of ours are, how are you bringing back to them that this is not about piddling around the edges. This is not about small change. It is about a paradigm shift and it is about really transforming our priorities. So I'm hoping that we will get to lots and lots of this um, today. And I'm gonna wind down there and just around maybe on the, on the more hopeful note of, you know, a lot of our work can be challenging and, and dark, sadly, and, you know, and, and gloomful, but to also think what we're doing is offering more Vision Zero at its very best is about more time, more birthdays, more celebrations, more life. So I hope that we can all uh, really step that up and bring that to our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Uh, and thank you for always being on the front line with the work that you're doing and the network that you've created. And we found you just as a partner to be you know, invaluable. And so I welcome everybody on the call to, to spend some time not just looking at the work that Leah has done, but also looking at how you can be more aligned with the Vision Zero Network. So on to uh, the next conversation that we'll have. Um, you know, a, a number of us as, as EDs of, of bike or pedestrian or, or active transportation organizations are incredibly privileged uh, to be in a role to help look at what's happening, not just in our cities and across the country, across the world, um, and also to, to be able to empathize with each other about the various challenges of not just advancing with these ideas, but the process of doing them. So here we have the incredible opportunity to learn from three peers uh, who are working in, in a diverse set of cities that also have a diverse set of challenges and opportunities of doing the work. Uh, Damon Richards, uh, who hails from uh, Bike Indianapolis, was a former small business owner turned bike advocate after completing a solo cross country ride. Um, and he's now been in the role, been working with Bike Indianapolis for I believe four years. Stacy Thompson is uh, ED at Livable Streets where she oversees all programs, including Vision Zero, Better Buses and the Emerald Network and ensuring that overall programmatic and operational excellence for the organization. And as she likes to say, she is a relentless optimist um, and Shiloh Ballard is ED at Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. Previously, she worked for over 14 years with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group uh, as a Senior Vice President of Housing and Community Development. And I also just personally am incredibly privileged to know each of them as peers in Shiloh. We had worked together in San Jose. And so what I'd like to do just to, to sort of help to frame introductions and add a little bit more texture to each of you is if you could just share a bit more about yourself, your work, and, and, and put that in the context of what Vision Zero looks like in your city. And so Damon, can I start with you? And then we'll go to Stacy and Shiloh, please. 
Okay. Um, Bike Indianapolis is a traditional bike advocacy group. Our mission is to get more butts on bikes uh, throughout the city for whatever reasons, recreational, transportation, you name it. Um, Indianapolis is a woefully unhealthy city, um, even though we are the headquarters of the American College of Sports Medicine, who puts out the annual fitness uh, survey every year. Um, so we have a real focus on whatever it takes to get people riding. Uh, our city is not a vision, city, vision zero city. Uh, we have a complete streets ordinance, which was as far as we could push the city. Uh, and we are doing a good job of getting them to enforce that ordinance, but there's not a whole lot of movement toward going further. Um, I don't know, what else do you want that do? Okay. More? If you're done. Yep, I'm done. Okay. Stacy? Sure. Uh, thanks, Danny. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a bummer not to see all of you. I was looking through the chat and I saw some friends from Boston and friends from around the country. Um, and so hopefully we'll all be gathered at the Vision Zero Cities Conference next year together. But in the meantime, I'm happy to see you all via Zoom. Um, Stacey Thompson, as Danny mentioned, the Executive Director at Livable Streets. Um, and I often say we are not a transportation advocacy organization. We are an access and equity organization. And the way that we think about you know, our streets is that they are our largest shared public spaces and that they should work for people. And that means they need to be safe. <laughs> they need to be accessible. They should be green. They should be places for commerce. They should be places for transit. Um, and so we often uh, say we do all the things. If it's a scooter, if it's a bike, if it's a bus, if it's a tree, like we're into it. Um, and, you know, I would say, uh, you know, part of that mix at Livable Streets is that we um, don't just focus on the city of Boston, we focus on the region and we help manage the Vision Zero Coalition, which is a statewide coalition in Massachusetts. Um, and so in the context of Vision Zero, it means we have the privilege of working with the city of Boston, as well as smaller communities like Somerville, um, like Worcester, like Lowell. Um, and I, I'm excited to have this conversation today because I think everyone across the country is sort of um, grappling with what's next. And in some cases it's in a city that has 2,500 people and in other um, cities, it's, it's New York size. So I'm excited to dig in. Great. Um, thank you uh, again, Danny, for inviting me here today with these great panelists. Uh, again, my name is Shiloh Ballard. I uh, get to run the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Silicon Valley, for a lot of folks, it is a state of mind, um, but we define it at the, at the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition as uh, including San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. Some other folks might include San Francisco in that definition, but I think San Francisco probably would not include them in the definition of Silicon Valley. But so two counties we cover, and that includes 35 cities and towns which is a whole lot of jurisdictions to be covering. And as many of you know, who cover a huge geography, uh, every city has its own uh, personality and they're all in some different state of evolution uh, in terms of their, their evolution towards Biketopia. Um, one of the cities that is within Silicon Valley is uh, San Jose, and that is where Danny used to work as the gatekeeper to a lot of money that was doled out by the Knight Foundation. Um, and he got to help uh, work with the city and the Bike Coalition in uh, pushing the city to uh, um, move forward on a great, wonderful bike network. Um, in terms of Vision Zero, it was around 2016 that the city of San Jose, uh, which I don't remember I said this, but it's about a, a population of just under a million, um, adopted a Vision Zero plan. And they recently just updated it and uh, reinforced that plan with more money and uh, kind of revisiting and saying, okay, what have we been doing? What's been working and what do we need to fund? Uh, that just happened a few weeks ago. And I think we can get a little more into that as we discuss things further. But in terms of the other 35 cities and towns, um, there we have about five that, that are in some, you know, whether it's 
formally adopting Vision Zero or kind of recognizing it in some way, shape or form. Um, but San Jose is definitely the, the furthest along. And I'll stop there. Thank you all. So I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, can you talk about how your work has changed since March? So what are you accelerating? What are you rethinking? What are you stopping? And specifically, I'd like to lean in within part of that of how you're thinking about enforcement. So Stacey, can I start with you? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I'll answer this in, in two ways. Um, one, we've gotten this question a lot, and I would say we really double down on the basics. Um, you know, we saw a lot of peers, and I, I, every city and every community is different, but we worked with our partners in the Metro Boston area to sort of rapidly check in with our partners that were really in frontline communities, communities that were being most impacted by COVID. And they did not say, you know, we want open streets. <laughs> they said, we. there are specific places where we feel unsafe. We need uh, more space at specific bus stops. We need um, more protected bike infrastructure. We are nervous to walk in certain locations. And we collected all that specific data and we sent it to the city. And we really doubled down on what we have been doing for the last 15 years, which is like, here is our list of bus lanes that we want you to implement this year. Here is our list of bike lanes you must implement this year. You know, we put our street ambassadors on the ground. Um, and, you know, I would say it's it's funny as advocates, uh, we will say we are, we are never happy. <laughs> we always want more. Um, but as you know, I have to give credit, if you look at maps, um, you know, the communities of Cambridge and Somerville have done a tremendous amount and they're very small communities. Um, communities across Massachusetts have implemented slow streets programs um, and the city of Boston has put down an entire is in the process of putting down a, an entire protected um, bike network in sort of the center of the city. Um, in addition, they just started putting paint on American Legion Highway um, to put up some protected bike lanes that was not on the plan this year and they got those down in addition to putting down several um, bus infrastructure projects. And so we, you know, it, it's, it's keeping people safe and it's keeping people moving. And I would just encourage folks to think like the work we do is really important to get frontline workers to their jobs, to keep people safe and like keep doing it. And it really matters. Um, um, you know, separately, the Vision Zero Coalition um, in Massachusetts has has long sort of uh, had a, a mixed relationship with enforcement, I will say. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, the way that we are approaching uh, the issue of enforcement, I would say is, again, doubling down on what we have al always felt, which is that um, you can't just say, take that E out of the E's, just ignore enforcement. To us, that is the equivalent of saying uh, all lives matter or I'm colorblind, right? Like as, as organizations that look at and work on streets, we must recognize that that is the most common place where police, um, you know, encounter black and brown people and, and cause harm. And so even if we design a street so that it is safe for speed, that does not sort of take away the discretionary policing that we are seeing as having like fatal consequences across the country. Um, so some of the things that we're doing that we have accelerated is doubling down our work, um, coordinating with the ACLU to make sure that any kind of automated enforcement that we um, suggest is equitable in terms of its data collection and how it might impact low income individuals. Um, we are reviewing all moving violations in the state of Massachusetts to try to determine which ones actually have a, sa a safety reason for existing. And guess what? There are a heck of a lot of moving violations that we just like don't need and maybe should reconsider entirely. Um, and we are also accelerating our work around restorative justice. You know, we've we have been for years concerned about you know, what happens to a person who, who kills someone um, in the prison industrial complex. And we cannot, you know, we can't deny that sending someone to prison can also cause harm. Um, and so looking at the other end of what happens when someone does commit violence. So, you know, small things, <laughs> but that's how we're, we're approaching things uh, here in Massachusetts. Thank you. Shyla? See how quick I can be to unmute myself. Um, I think we're all getting very talented at that. Um, so, so to the first part of the question in terms of what's changed, um, you know, I think at first for all of us, we, we basically we were just kind of stopped 
to, we were all just trying to figure out what, what is the future going to look like a week from now, a month from now, two months from now. And we were all, I think, especially as executive directors in the, in the kind of bike livability, walkability space where reaching out to each other and say, what is it saying? What does your crystal ball say? What's the future of transportation going to look like? Um, so I would say in answer to that first part of the question, we were just kind of, uh, you know, a little bit voluntary, well, uh, involuntarily paralyzed, but it was a little bit of a choice. Um, it didn't seem appropriate for us to be pushing the cities on our agenda when they were struggling to figure out how to just be you know, making sure that folks who had been going to school got fed. Um, so I think that was the first reaction. The second reaction was we all realized that this really hard, difficult thing that we've been talking about, which is behavior change, getting people to not default to their car, uh, could actually happen really, really quickly if we were faced with, you know, no other, no other choice. And so then it was a matter of capitalizing on that, that opportunity. Um, and so in, as I noted before, we cover 35 cities and towns um, and we immediately started pushing cities to be um, taking some low hanging fruit uh, actions, um, also pushing on uh, slow streets, open streets networks, um, and I would say it's interesting, you know, San Mateo County is very different than Santa Clara County, and we had a number of cities adopt a slow streets network in San Mateo County, and close to zero adopt a slow streets network in Santa Clara County, um, but for Palo Alto. Um, so those were, those were kind of some of the immediate things on the, uh, and there were a lot of other things too that I, we can go into if we have time, but on the enforcement um, uh, question and issue um, for us, and this is one of those topics where you know we could spend the rest of the time talking. Of course, um, you know historically speaking, our organization had not necessarily paid attention to enforcement um, for all the reasons that we're aware of. It just wasn't something that we worked on. We were focused on. Um, design primarily as our go-to tool, uh, but it became apparent that, you know, in the bike world, we were being pushed to be more involved in enforcement. And so one of the first things that we started doing was just trying to, you know, we've, we've got our board of directors, we have our staff, and then we have a membership. And each of those levels or aspects of our organization is in a different state of mind in terms of enforcement. And it became very clear that in terms of our membership, we needed to just do some basic education. And so that's what we've been trying to be a little more intentional about over the past two years is just, you know, why wouldn't enforcement be our go-to tool in the bike advocacy movement? Um, I'll stop there and pass it on to Damon and happy to talk further about any of that. Okay, um, let's see. We looked brilliant uh, in this light of the pandemic, but only from sheer luck. Uh, for years and years, we've been pounding on our city planners that um, our bicycle network isn't a network. It's a, a series of little disjointed half mile, mile long strips of infrastructure that came about because of the complete streets ordinance. You're gonna repave the street, you gotta put a bike lane on it, you gotta put a sidewalk on it. Well, it went from nowhere to nowhere. So for years we've been pounding and saying, some of the money has to get spent connecting this stuff so people can go somewhere on it. And as luck would have it, this was that year. Uh, the city already had plans to, to put in new infrastructure and every piece of it was connecting existing infrastructure. And so as people started dusting off the bicycles in their garages and basements and coming out on the streets, they found there's this fabulous network to ride on. And I look like a genius, so I'll take credit. Uh, but it, it, it just became this, this fantastic thing. And then we started talking about, well, let's do some slow streets and some open streets and discovered that our city um, contracted out parking meter enforcement. It's a 50-year contract, and the contract holder 
gets paid for every parking meter that gets blocked and can't be used. So for us to close down streets, the city had to write these giant checks to this parking meter contractor. So it made it really hard to do some of that stuff. We still got a little done, but not near as much as we'd hoped for. Um, but it, it, it looked like we were ready and had all this stuff in place and it just was because of the timing that that happened. Um, as to enforcement, uh, we're Indianapolis. We are the home of the Indy 500. We believe in cars and we believe in them going fast. Um, it's a really, really big challenge for our police department to do enforcement uh, because they are traditionally understaffed and Indianapolis is on track to set it to break its record for the number of homicides this year. So enforcement has never been a big issue for us to push because it doesn't happen. Um, speeding in our city is rampant and we've lowered the speed limits. We're down to 25 miles an hour in our core, uh, but it doesn't stop people from just zooming along. So we've not had big enforcement issues just because it hasn't been something that's been happening. So I'll stop there. Thanks. So if I if I can just sort of take um, uh, a facilitator's prerogative just from a question that was raised here and, and just share two or three prompts from New York City as well. So um, I think like most of, of my counterparts here, you know, a lot of the ideas that we've been pushing since March are ones that, you know, we've all been experimenting with and advocating for for years or decades. And so I think where our perspective in New York changed and where we have seen um, sort of the, the ability to try to, to come out hopefully in a better situation on the other side is, is that, you know, one, we're telling a story of streets for recovery and we want to move away from bikes or buses. But I think, you know, especially in a, in a dense urban environment where you have schools, restaurants, retail, cultural institutions that are all seeking space, we wanted really to build out that tent of the number of partners. And I would just add as a caveat within that, and I imagine some of you are seeing it in your other spaces, is, you know, before we got table scraps, now we still have the same table scraps, but we have to fight with more partners for it. So before, if it was active transportation, versus, you know, cars and now it's us versus restaurants versus 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 everybody that wants a little bit of space. Um, so I think that's that's one thing where, you know, we've seen that as an opportunity, but also and building those relationships, but also it's leading to conflict largely just because of the spatial design. The second is that, you know, we did as we put out that call, we put out a report, especially on open streets that looked at where the open streets were and where they weren't. And what we saw was, you know, at least two boroughs were did got no protected bike lanes open streets were not rolled out in low income communities of color and that you know the way that the network was rolled out even immediately was not equitable so we use that as an opportunity to shine a light um, on you know what we've always known in the space of transportation in terms of who gets the benefits and who doesn't and use that as a way to, to drive our advocacy and sort of the second pillar of that was also doing a report on self enforcing streets where we took a hard look at what it would look like if we took um, NYPD out of traffic enforcement, or at least removed the budget and put it into DOT with a focus on things like automated enforcement or um, or street design. And I would say the last piece, which is really what you know we need to be doing much more work on, and we're sort of focusing it on in the next few months, is is going out and doing more listening campaigns. Um, I think Stacy, to exactly what you started with, if you don't fully understand the needs in the community, especially the communities that haven't been listened to or have been listened to, but their advice and ideas have gone absolutely nowhere, um, you know, that that's a failure on all of our part. So as we go with sort of a deeper intention about listening work and go into more communities, especially low income communities of color that have been on the front line of traffic, traffic violence, you know, I, we need to do a better job of not just that type of work, but also in terms of the methodology and doing more outreach into communities. So that was just sort of a, a bit from New York. And with that, let me turn it back um, to the panelists. So, you know, the things that, that each of you had mentioned are obviously really expanding your work in an age where I'm sure your budgets are probably shrinking and there are more pressures that are upon you. 
So given what you had sort of talked about in terms of the additional work, more listening, you know, more outward facing work, how are you balancing that in terms of, you know, Shiloh, you mentioned in terms of communication and education with some members, um, you know, Stacy, you're talking about it in terms of growing partnerships. Damon, you're, th you're thinking about this also as your organization is in a really critical place. So can you just kind of help us to frame the moment and, you know, the opportunities and challenges with just, you know, your on the ground realities of doing this work right now, given, you know, where your budgets are and, and uh, you know, some of those other realities, especially the pushback from your members. Damon, can I start with you and then Stacey and Shiloh? Sure. Um, my organization is extremely small. I, I am the entire staff. Uh, I rely heavily on volunteers. Um, and we, we make most of our money through uh, classes uh, and events. And the pandemic kind of wiped out all of that. So we, we have struggled mightily uh, financially this year. Um, but it was also, there was a, a good side to that. The fact that we couldn't do the things we normally do in a writing season left us with, well, what can we do? And what we found we could do was we could take uh, small groups or individuals, just take them out on bike rides. And, and I found it was amazing to take people or try to take people with a little influence in the community, but I took anybody who was willing to ride and showed them their neighborhood by bicycle. And, and it was amazing because, you know, those of us, those of you who are bike riders know it's almost impossible to ride a bike without a grin on your face. And for people who had not ridden in a long time, it was a great experience. And, and it's something that I'm trying to incorporate into our programming going forward is getting people who aren't bike riders out on a bicycle. Um, because you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a 15, 20 mile ride. It can be a two or three mile ride. And that's enough for them to, to get that feeling and for them to experience their city at 12 miles an hour. Uh, so uh, we're gonna struggle for a while because um, as somebody said earlier, it's, it's hard to say, give me money for bicycle advocacy when you've got to worry about how are you going to feed these kids because they used to get food at school and they're not going. Um, and a lot of our funders have, have given us that message as well. So we know we'll struggle financially, but it almost created a, a, a new sense of urgency as you see how quickly people uh, um, fall in love again with being outdoors and with, with moving a little slower. And so uh, good and bad, I guess. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, there's a lot I could say. I'm also going to try to speak to someone asked a question in the panel around how we established a relationship with ACLU. So I will try to address that, loop this in. Um, and, and I would say a couple of things. First, um, to all of our Black, Indigenous, people of color, to all the ladies out there, I know you're tired. Like, and I would just, I want to acknowledge, like, when, you know, how, how are you handling it? Like, people are not. Like, we have members in our Vision Zero community who, like, are on the edge. <laughs> And so like, just like taking care of our community, like needs to be like at, at the forefront, right? Like, I think it's okay to say like, we're like kind of barely holding it together. <laughs> um, and some, and some folks are, like are getting it from all sides right now. Um, so that's one, it's kind of a hot mess. And we're just, we assume that it's going to be like that for the foreseeable future. And we've been trying, we've tried to be honest. Um, what that means is that, you know, as an organization, we've, um, ha we've been very specific in our communication to our members. Um, and that has meant, you know, early in the day, similar to Shiloh, you know, we, we told our, our members to stay home. <laughs> we we're like, if you are white and you are privileged, like stay home. And we need to let the city like build a temporary hospital in the convention center and we'll get to your needs later. Um, and I will candidly say there are some bros on Twitter who hate my guts. Um, we got trolled pretty badly. There are, you know, traditional people who've been with us for 20 or 30 years who were just angry like angry that building bike lanes was like not the most important thing in the whole world um but i just like that's okay because what it means is that our movement is becoming more expensive expansive um and you know so what i you know 
yes, like we communicated to our members about the importance of these things. Yes, we got trolled and I like pissed off some white dudes in spandex and that's cool. Like that's fine. Um, and, and I think that we need to be okay with ruffling feathers a little bit. Um, if we're going to move forward and do things differently, like, like Leah brought this up earlier. Um, but it also means that we just like have really, really doubled down in our coalition building and to try to have expansive coalitions. Um, and this has been true in our transit advocacy and our slow streets advocacy. Um, and, you know, like one of the things that we've done is just like authentically show up and find out where we can help. And the, the, the exam, I will use one example. Um, this is pre pandemic, but it, it continues to be really important for us. Um, there is a bill on the books in Massachusetts to give undocumented persons the ability to get a driver's license license. Um, and we that is an immigration's rights issue that we have made a vision zero priority, both because it is important to people who are undocumented, you know, their ability to do a lot of things, but they will also go through driver's ed which is actually safer for everyone. Um, and so like, we're gonna put time and energy into this and we're gonna, you know, like the, the immigrants right community is leading on this and we are following. Um, separately, we've sort of made a commitment that if we are going to be moving something like uh, trying to make uh, progress in automated enforcement, which is illegal in Massachusetts right now, that we'll check in with the ACLU. So before we worked on filing a bill last session, we actually went over every line of the language. We like reached out to the ACLU, asked to have a conversation, and then went through all everything we were going to propose. And they gave us a lot of suggestions to make the legislation better. There are other automated enforcement um, bills out there that we do not support because they don't include protections. Um, and so I think like we've we've been able to really build um, a good relationship with with those partners who really understand civil rights because we took every piece of feedback they gave to us seriously and didn't make excuses about it not being our job, being too much, um, and it's it's really paid off. So I would say um, you know that sort of doubling down on intersectionality has been really important for us. Great. Um, so in, in response to the question around, like, how do we continue to do this work in an increasingly resource constrained world? Um, I mean, I'll go back to the fact that we, you know, we in the local nonprofit community are always facing constrained resources. How do we, the, the problem is X plus and we only have a budget of this and um, there's so much work to do. Uh, our answer to that question before and even more now is um, kind of a, a little bit what Stacy was just saying, except um, uh, slightly different. And that is when I, as the executive director of SVBC, think about what is where do we derive our power? Where, where does a nonprofit like us derive our power? How do we get the mayor to return our phone call? How do we get the votes? Um, I came from the business community uh, for 14 years and they had money and influence. We in the bike movement do not have money and influence. So that's not where we derive our power. Um, and we have another organization at, at, uh, in Silicon Valley or in San Jose called Spur. They're more of a, an insider, you know, strong relationships, real policy expertise. And they, they wield their influence in that way with relationships with staff. Um, We've, we've been a little bit of that in the past, but really uh, what we have and what all of our organizations have are the biggest asset is these, you know, thousands of passionate bicyclists who, if you just, you know, harness that power and point it in the right direction, uh, you can amazing things. And um, so the, the Bike Coalition staff in, in Silicon Valley is always like, oh, we need to get to the city to do this, or we need to, um, they need to front load funding for bike projects on this. I'm like, yes, we do. And your strongly worded letter is not going to do it. So <laughs> what we have to do is we have to organize and mobilize folks. So Danny, in response to the question of like, you know, how, how are we operating in more of a resource constrained world? Um, we are doubling down on, on our strategy that we already were relying on and we're finally positioned to be ramping up. And that is to, uh, once, once COVID happened and we had our program team essentially not doing anything, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it, you, know, you couldn't go out and teach people how to ride bikes and our program revenues dried up. Um, we took the staff time and we reinvested it in membership and building, growing, engaging, training, 
um, figuring out how to harness that power of all those bicyclists out there to unleash them. And so very specifically, um, and I know some, a lot of the bike coalitions already do this, uh, we form local teams because we want to have, you know, anywhere from just five to 10 savvy um, advocates in, a, in our priority communities who we can support and then just have them drive the agenda in their city. So that's, that's kind of how we are responding, Danny, to, to that question. And I know that there, there are a lot of questions that are coming through, so I want to turn to them in a second. But I, I just want to ask briefly, um, are there cities that you're looking for for inspiration um, on sort of specific elements of your work? And also, you know, who are you helping? Or are you helping any of the other communities or partners um, to obviously share your expertise? As the spirit moves you, please jump I, in. I'll, I'll jump in here because I, I tell my board this all the time. Um, when I started in this and I said, I, I came from the business world, I ran a small business for 25 years, became a bicycle advocate almost by accident. Um, so I started looking around the country at, you know, who else is out there? What are they doing? So for the last three years, I have constantly tell my board, when we grow up, we're going to be bike Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, and we, we steal a lot of ideas from them, uh, sometimes blatantly, sometimes with credit. Uh, because they've, they've built an organization, which we're still trying to do. I mean, I, we're staff of me, so we're a long way from having an organization, but they've built it and, and it, it gets things done and it is financially viable because it has multiple income streams. So we, we look to them a lot. Um, I work with some of the smaller communities here in Indiana who are, are they don't have a formal bicycle advocacy group, but they've got a, a group of hardcore riders who care and trying to help them just think about the kinds of things that Shiloh just talked about. It's like, you guys don't have enough money to buy an election. So you got to start figuring out how can you have an influence? And, and this thing that we kind of stumbled into of taking people out for bike rides, the, the thought I realized later was planted in my head by Yay Bikes in Columbus, Ohio, because that's kind of was their primary form of advocacy when they got started was they just took people out for bike rides and showed them what riding in their city was like. So I, my view of what we ought to be doing has been changed by the pandemic because it, like most small organizations, you're caught between doing the things that are important and doing the things that are urgent. And way too much of my time was being spent on urgent instead of important. And since the pandemic kind of slowed that down, I got to focus on important and realize things that I didn't even realize were important have become a lot more. So that's my take. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump in and uh, say, answer it, maybe flip the city question on its head and just say that um, I think it's really important in this moment to look beyond the pretty pictures. Um, it's, you know, we're used to going to conferences where there's like a photo, you know, like the, the, the classic New York Times photo times a million, right? Where you see the photo and it's like sunny and there are a million people walking. Um, but that often doesn't tell the full story about how a community got to that picture, um, what parts of the city didn't get that treatment that should have. Um, and so, it, you know, and I, I, I bring it up a lot. There's um, There's been a lot to focus on Paris in particular, which is doing great things as a city, but then we ignore that the Parisian suburbs are home to um, immigrants and they have had the worst infection rates in, in uh, France um, and they do not get those same sort of um, transportation improvements. And so even when we look, you know, we read a headline, we look at a picture and we say, gosh, I want to be in that other city. And you know, what, what we're trying to do in Boston, especially as we grapple with like being very proud and wanting more is like, what is, ex what is inspiring you? Like, what would you go take a picture of in your own city or town that you would wanna show at the Vision Zero City Conference? And then like try to do that times 100 um, because that's what everyone is actually doing. And I think that we need to do a little bit more of, of that. <laughs> and I'll just plus one to both of those comments and add one other thing. And that is um, it just like uh, from a very, like therapeutic point of view in terms of, to use one word, um, 
you know, when all this happened, um, there were a few, the, the executive directors in the Bay Area of the Bike Coalition started meeting together on Zoom regularly. Uh, and then um, Danny has convened a group of, of executive directors nationwide. And it's those groups that are really helpful in terms of um, just being a sounding board, getting ideas, um, discussing things that are coming up. Um, but those are, those are super useful uh, groups. I think, um, so why don't we open up, uh, there are a few questions, but you have questions and please post them on the chat. And, and just with that, um, you know, I think one of the things, especially as we look across our communities, uh, that seems an opportunity for all of us is also just to be looking internally at, at what is working in our cities. And I think, you know, when people ask that question about New York, you know, I think they expect to, to talk about any of the litany of cities and I think the reality is that we actually have some some really amazing projects, even at a very local level, that you know advocates have had to fight for years or decades for, and we haven't actually scaled them. So I think the problem in a lot of our cities is we have these models that we fought for and they work, and yet we're now you know still fighting maybe a little bit less hard to get to two or to get to ten instead of taking what's already working that has community input and scaling those across the city. And that for us is bike infrastructure, that's protected bus lanes. Those are, you know, uh, reclaiming space for pedestrians. And, you know, I think we, we know that those are typically playing out in higher income neighborhoods. And, you know, I don't want to be taking people to Copenhagen or Paris. I think we can take them to 14th Street in New York and to see it and ask how we can bring that to Flushing or to J Street or the other neighborhoods that are, you know, asking for these busways and want them to play out in a way that's, you know, relevant to the community needs. So. I think on that piece, and again, I know New York is in a different place than other cities, but you know, Damon, your bike rides, I would, I would encourage those bike rides to go into the things that are working locally, or at least that are close enough that you can take a bike ride to. Um, so I wanted to ask the, the one question that that's continued to come through, and Stacey, I know you mentioned it a bit, but um, I'm curious if any of you have experience with, you know, either advocacy for cameras or thinking about automated enforcement as a tool now, especially as you're seeing budget cuts go down. So uh, I'll open that up if anybody has a perspective here to share. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. This is a, this is a, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. It's a, a secret priority of bike Indianapolis. <laughs> uh, Not and, and it's, yeah, right. And it's, and it's been uh, heightened by by the whole racial justice movement uh traffic enforcement is is that most uh critical way that law enforcement comes in contact with the public there's a lot of discretion in whether or not you pull somebody over and uh, the reasoning behind why has a whole lot of stuff into it um but like i said indianapolis home of the indy 500 we believe in going fast um, there's no way we could enforce speed limits and red lights without doing something automated. But we're the Hoosier state and we like to be last to do everything. We are the last state to put fluoride in our water. Um, it's going to take a lot to get any kind of movement. And so we started some really low level talks with, with folks who can at least start having the conversations with the right people. But you all will have automated enforcement in your communities before we do. And we realize that, but we think it's a really important thing for safety reasons, as well as for racial justice reasons. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll jump in and say, Massachusetts likes to think that it's like liberal and at the forefront of stuff. And then there's a lot of stuff that we are just super regressive on. So um, I don't know, we're in a race to last with you. I thank God an automated enforcement, but that's not going to stop us. Um, so yeah, just a, a few things. And I'm happy um, the Vision Zero Coalition has um, like a FAQ on this and maybe we can put it in the chat or like work with TA on the magic of like how to get this to y'all after. Um, but a few things, the way that we are approaching um, automated enforcement 
is very specific. And I, I do think this is really important. So we are only focused on automated enforcement for um, the most dangerous behaviors. So that's speed and red light cameras for us. Um, there's a proliferation of surveillance and cameras in our communities that do a lot of things that have nothing to do with safety. And so it's really rooted in safety. The fees are uh, only $25 non-escalating. You don't lose points. Um, it's really like, we don't want to um, have people's lives destroyed if they can't pay a fine. Um, and we don't want it to be revenue generating. Our goal with automated enforcement is that they never generate a penny because no one is breaking the law. Um, and so they're, you know, the way that the bill is constructed is to really center on that. And the places where, you know, the, the surveillance reasons and sort of the, the revenue generating reasons are often the reasons why these projects fail, right? Like a sort of gotcha, and then it's a really big fine, and then the public revolts. Um, and so I, I do think that there's a path forward, um, but it has to be a very specific path forward because there are a lot of ways that um, automated enforcement can 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 be used um, in a really dangerous way. And I think we have to acknowledge that as we move forward. Yeah, in addition to all of that, I'll just add the, the story in California and San Jose and San Francisco um, was that I think it was in 2016, we um, ran a, a bill uh, that was, so it's illegal uh, for us in, in California to have automated speed safety um, and cameras. And uh, so we ran a bill uh, authored by assembly member Chu. Uh, it basically got killed by the police officers union. Uh, and it was only, it was a pilot only for San Francisco and San Jose. So we were carving it out in a way that we thought was palatable and addressing all of the problematic parts of it. Um, we have not attempted to do it since, but uh, I keep hearing rumblings that folks want to make an, an attempt to do it again. Um, in the absence of that, in San Jose, uh, the mayor did float this idea of, okay, well, we can't do uh, speed cameras. Why don't we do red light cameras and they'll just be warnings. We won't be giving tickets. So that is being contemplated right now. So we will see. I feel like we have the same old story of like tried something, police officer, police officers union killed it. And it's just until we fix that, until we can fix the politics of it, we're not gonna be able to get anywhere. Let me welcome back Leah to weigh in on this as well. Thank you. Sorry about that. I just want to jump in and say, I think this is one of those areas where uh, ditto everything everyone said. There's, there's good ways to do it, bad ways to do it, dangerous ways to do it. There's a lot to figure out strategy wise. But I think this is one where we're letting, we're not taking the bigger, bolder, high ground here and we could and should be. So back to the science, people are gonna keep dying on our streets if people drive at 35, 40 miles per hour or more where people are also walking and biking. We should be throwing everything we can at that and figuring out with partners how to do it well. But it, it, this is one of those opportunities where it's, it's, it's a culture change issue where we need to kind of push up to say, hey, why do we allow this? This is, this is just straight science as a physics question, right? So to speed, is automated speed enforcement the right thing? Is it this, is it this? We could take the next 20 years to figure this out, but we shouldn't and we can't. There's a bunch of things we can do effectively and I would say equitably if done well in five years. All of your cities should be bringing speeds down in a city, I'm not saying on a highway, to 20, 25 miles per hour or less, period. It's, it should be a non-negotiable. I think we will look back on this many years from now and say, why did we give ourselves or the leaders so long? Why did we take so long on this? Thanks. Yeah. Danny, I wanna chime in on that and just offer a, a data point. We just did for the first time some public opinion research in Santa Clara County where we were asking people just generally to, to understand transportation attitudes. And of course there was a focus on bicycling, but it really was broadly about transportation. And when it came to this question about around the things that we can do that are palatable to the public that will constrain drivers and driving, um, when we asked them, are you okay if we take away a lane? No way in hell. Are you okay if we take away your parking? No way in hell. When we asked them, what about lowering speed limits? They were like, eh, I, I, could, I could see that. I'm a little more open to that. So I throw that out there as a little hopeful piece. Thanks. So with that, um, 
we had another question and then I, I had a final prompt that I, I'd like you each to, to, to leave us with. So maybe with this question, if we could just get one response. Um, so Ellen asks, how do we reach drivers, passengers and help them understand that vision zero is for them too? Well, I, I'll just, I don't have an answer to that question specifically, but again, going back to the polling data, we were surprised. We asked people questions about like, do drivers have more of a responsibility for keeping the road safe? And there were, there were a bunch of questions we asked that tried to gauge how drivers feel about their responsibility towards safety. And we were surprised that they overall, the respondents to this survey were saying, yeah, drivers do have a greater responsibility. So that too is hopeful. Great, thank you. Um, and Diane, you asked the question about why the, why the speed limit in New York City is in 20 and uh, we also don't know the answer and we're fighting for that as well. So uh, it should be, I, th I think that's the answer we can agree with. Uh, so with that, I'd, I'd like to ask actually, if I can invite all four panelists, um, I, I, this is not a silver bullet question, but you know, we, we, wanna be bit, we wanna be bold and ambitious in our ideas. So what I'd asked each of them was, if there was one policy or action that they could be taking in their city uh, over the course of the next year that they believe could bring transformational change towards Vision Zero, what would that be? Stacy, do you want to kick us off and then we'll go Damon, um, Shiloh, and then we'll end with Leah? Yeah, I, I will start by saying that on the uh, very first day of the stay at home order in the city of Boston, um, we were supposed to be launching our Go Boston 2030 accountability report, which is a report that we were releasing um, to assess the city's progress toward their transportation uh, plan goals. Um, and there, I think there's a bit of irony in this because it's a great plan. Uh, and a couple of things that we highlighted in Go Boston 2030 um, is are that they were behind on building the bike network and behind on walkable, bikeable main streets. And then these happen to be the two areas where we like really need to make progress and have needed to really focus during COVID. So from our perspective, and I think this is true in many other cities, we just want Boston to like implement the plan they already have on the books. And I think that that will be transformative. And I think for many folks across the country, it's just like, we just want you to like do the thing you already said you were gonna do. Um, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> Wow, that's incredible. I, I, as you said that, it's like, yeah, we, we could do that too. Um, I just, my, my real, my first response answer to that is not a policy or procedure or anything. It's an educational thing. And, and you see it in this stream of comments. If everyone knew, internalized what their responsibility was for everybody else's safety, our problems would be solved. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer this in a high level vague way. And that is to, I think it goes back to something that Leah said, um, but we, we need to be bolder uh, and more aggressive about just constraining driving. So whether that's, you know, more space on the streets or just shutting down street, more streets, taking on street parking, any, any and all of that. Yeah. Now, Adan we will be, I hope, we will be calling out these as political choices, not technical or practical choices in the end. What, what, is, what is gonna be decided is political and moral decisions. We know how to stop the epidemic of traffic violence. It's as if we had a pandemic, or a, sorry, it's as if we had a uh, vaccine for the pandemic, but didn't apply it. It's as if we ignored the science and people kept dying. That is what's happening with traffic violence in our country. Amen. Uh, in our case, uh, we're looking a lot at level of service. And I think, you know, Stacey, your point, yeah, there are the shiny, beautiful images. And what we're looking for are the real, like, technical, structural pieces that just, when you start to change them, they start to change everything else, uh, because it's sort of embedded in the funding and the data and the research. So we're looking at that as a model to go at the state level about a uh, people level of service instead of, as you all know, the, the car-based one now. Um, so with that, I wanna thank all of you. And, and just, I also wanna encourage everybody on the call. We have a, a really incredible program today. And we also have a, a Congressman uh, Chuy Garcia, who's gonna be joining us. And as you know, he's the um, sort of a, a leading voice on our issue set uh, in Washington also in Chicago, um, but he's also been pushing for a lot of really forward-leaning things with 
Vision Zero, um, also with Level of Service. So, you know, we're excited to have him join the program today. And so with that, I think we actually turn next to the Repeal Robert Moses, which is our panel about reimagining highway infrastructure and the racist legacy of highway infrastructure across our cities. So thank you to our incredible panelists, uh, Stacy, Damon, Shiloh, Leah. Uh, thank you all for doing the good work under challenging circumstances. Um, and thank you for leaving us with a lot of hope and optimism about what comes next for our movement and also what's happening in your cities. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.